Welcome to our Bible study. I'm Pastor Will Ferguson. And in this session, we are going to cover an overview, a quick overview of the entire book of Romans. And you see behind me in my, in my elegant handwriting, I have, I have written down the progression, the, an outline of the book of Romans. And, and while I'm here, this outline that I have was not something I came up on my own. This was an outline that, was, that I found as I studied through the years that really worked well uh, with a, an organization called Walk Through the Bible Ministries. Um, and so they, they did that. And I, I tweaked it a little bit because there were some words that they were, they were, they were alliterating it, where it's all S's. And um, sometimes it, it doesn't quite work when they try to do that. So anyway, um, I hope that at the end of this study, you will have a great understanding of the great salvation that God has called us to. In fact, um, there, is a, there is an intended result that the Apostle Paul has in writing this letter. And we're going to look at that tonight, or, or in this session, and we're going to look at it. And I want to share with you how that unfolds in, in these points here. Now, before we do that, let's just pray and then ask God's help as we study uh, this book. Father, I pray as we study this book, ask God that your spirit will enable the eyes of our understanding, of the, our minds to see what your truth says. Father, help us. Help us to understand these things. Help us to think on these things. And Lord, as we go through this, help, help it to be in such a way that we can remember it so that we can meditate on it. We thank you, Father, for this great salvation. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Okay, so let's begin. Now, the book of Romans is a letter that is written by the Apostle Paul to a group of Roman Christians at Rome. Now, here's the thing about that. Paul has never met these guys. He's only heard about this, these group of Roman Christians, these people becoming Christians in Rome. And Paul is very eager to hear about their faith, to hear about their status. He's very eager also to help establish them in the faith and to strengthen them. See, Paul was a, a guy that was doing ministry and going around planting churches and doing evangelism, establishing Christian communities. And this was the thing he was doing. This was the thing that God called him to. And so he was very eager to do that. So in this letter, there is definitely an, an, an intention of where he wanted to go. And there was a, a flow of thought. So that's what we're going to look at in this session. So in this letter, you have an introduction and you have a conclusion, okay? And in the introduction, he starts off, I'm gonna share with you verse five in chapter one, verse one through 17, that's the introduction. But verse five, I believe is key to seeing Paul begin how this flow of thought goes in that. And I wanna read that. If you'll look that up in your Bibles, in verse five, he says, talks about his own ministry, he says, through whom, or through Jesus, we have received grace and apostleship. He says this, to bring about the obedience of faith for the sake of his name among all the nations, including you who are called to belong to Jesus Christ. Notice here the, the desired outcome of what Paul is saying, the desired outcome of his ministry, and the desired outcome that he has for those who are in Rome. Okay, the desired outcome is to, he said, to bring about the obedience of faith. And by the way, this very statement is also said in the very last verse in Romans. If I can look back here, I'll just, I'll read that for you real quick and I'll find it. Romans chapter 16. Actually, not the very last verse, but the next to the last verse. Romans chapter 16, verse 26. He says, uh, talking about Jesus has been now disclosed and through prof the prophetic writings has made known to all nations according to the commandment of the eternal God to bring about 
the obedience of faith. So this is the, this is the impact that Paul wants to have in his ministry, from his ministry to other people, and definitely from this writing to the Romans. And not only that, but it's also the impact he would desire for us as we read this book that we would, uh, it would bring about obedience of faith in us as well. Also in the introduction, there's another verse I want to read. It, it, it's relevant. He says, for in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith. As, as it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. So in the entire book of Romans, Paul is going to show us how we are going to live obedient to the faith. How we're going to live by faith in Jesus Christ. And that's the outcome he desires. That people begin that the just shall live by faith. All right? So how does that work? So we see that thought is going to be unfolded throughout the entire book of Romans. So he begins, the first point, begins chapter 1, verse 18. It goes all the way to chapter 3, verse 24, and that roundabout that, that area. He talks about sin. Those chapters, he nails sin. Not only does he talk about sin, he talks about the wrath of God against sinners. That God will judge sin. And a key verse from key verses from that is verse 27 and 28 in chapter 3. I want to read that. That's part of thought. So he begins with this idea. Chapter 3, and remember, how do we bring about obedience of, under the faith? The first point is people have to understand that they're sinners. And then he goes to verse 27, chapter 3, verse 27, he says, then what becomes of our boasting? It is excluded. By what kind of law? By law of works? No, but by the law of faith. For we hold that one is justified by faith apart from the works of the law. So the first step in learning how to walk by faith and to live by faith is we have to be stripped of all of our self-confidence. That we're no longer, we, can, we can't boast in ourselves. We can only boast in what Christ has done for us. So faith has an object. Faith has a focus. And the focus of our faith is not ourselves. The focus of our faith is away from ourselves and what he says here to Jesus. We hold that one is justified by faith apart from the works of the law. Okay, so that's what he said. First, he begins with sin of, of of destroying our self-confidence so that we get confident in Christ. So once he goes from sin, that was a transitional phrase, transitional verses, because he's going to talk about being justified in Christ. Chapter 3, verse 24 through 5, verse 21, he talks about being justified by faith in Jesus Christ. Um, being justified is how God makes us how God works in us to make us have be, be in good standing with him. How God justifies a person who's ungodly. Something is totally broken and God makes it work. And how does he do that? He, un, he unpacks that in those chapters. Chapters 4 and chapters 5. In fact, chapter 5 verse 1 is a key verse in that section. He says, therefore, since we have been justified by faith... We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. So he emphasizes that we are justified by faith. So the flow of thought goes into that. We have peace with God who had, in this one, we saw that he was angry. His wrath was upon us because of our sin. But because of our faith in Jesus Christ, we now have peace with God. God's wrath is no longer on us. And so, so we are justified by faith. All right, so we go, it flows, the flow goes from sin, it goes to justification, and then it goes to a big long word, sanctification. And that's in chapter 6, verse 1, let me go on this side. <laughs> chapter 6, verse 1 through 8, 39. Sanctification, it's one of them big long words, people don't, you know, kind of don't think about it a lot. But here's the thing, the flow of thought goes, if I have been justified by faith, here I am, un I'm ungodly, 
I've been justified by faith, not by doing something good or being good, being better, but just in my state. If God justified me as I am, then why would I want to live a holy life? Why would I want to be good? Because God freely justified me, and that's what he addresses in, in uh, Romans chapter 6. Look at uh, there, the verse, first verse there, Romans chapter 6. I mean, he's anticipating that people are going to think that. He says, what shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means. So he's going to, so the flaw of thought continues and he's going to unpack that. Really the key, key verses in chapter 7, verse 4 through 8 are key verses. And I'm going to read that. He says, my brothers... You have died to the law through the body of Christ, so that you may belong to another, to him who has been raised from the dead, in order that we may bear fruit for God. For while we were living in the flesh, our sinful passions were aroused by the law, were working our members to bear fruit for death. But now we are released from the law, having died to that which held us captive, so that we serve in the new way of the spirit and not in the old way of the written code. So what, what, what Paul is going to say, the answer to this, the reason we want to live holy, the reason is we begin not living by confidence in ourselves, but by living confident in the life that God has put within me by this Holy Spirit. And that's what he's saying. And he un unpacks that in greater detail. Okay, so, so the flow of thought continues, continues down through here. God sanctifies us by the sanctifying influence of the Holy Spirit in our life. This is really cool stuff. This is New Testament because the, the uh, onus of getting us to live righteous, we, not, we have been declared righteous by God, but the onus of getting us to live righteous is on God. We begin to focus on Him, not ourselves. And that's how God set this up. Our faith must look to Him. So when we talk about obedient, to the faith, a big part of that has to be, I am focusing on Christ, and Christ in me is what I focus on. I can't do this, but Christ in me can. You see, that, that's, that's, that's New Testament. That's what it says here, okay? All right, so we go on to the next portion, and actually, he starts talking about Israel. It's interesting. We go through sin, justification, sanctification. Why in the world does he start talking about Israel? What does Israel have to do with this? It was because there's a verse in chapter 8. He, he says something in chapter, the last part of chapter 8 that causes him to think about, well, what about Israel? So he says in chapter 8, chapter 8, verse 38, he says, I am sure that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Now we see that, we see that as he looks at the church, he looks at what Christ has done for us, that nothing can separate us from his love. And then there's this little thing in the back of his mind that says, well, wait a minute, what about Israel? God abandoned Israel. He's, his love is separated for, for Israel. What about them? If God abandoned Israel, who had the covenants and the promises, and all of those things that he's saying that we have, then would he not also abandon us when it comes down to it? That's why he has to deal with Israel. That's why he has to talk about him. Because if God got rid of Israel and replaced them with the church, then he can replace us with something else. Okay? And so what Paul does in chapters 9 through 11, he talks about Israel and basically saying, no, God has not gotten rid of his people Israel. He's not, he's not forsaken them. He's going to fulfill his promises. He's going to stay good to that. A verse in that, chapter 11, verse 28. I know you can see that, can't you, right? It's really good. Ch chapter 11, verse 28. <clears throat> this is what he says, and this is the key verse here. He's talking about Israel, the Jews, present day Israel. He says, as regards to the gospel, 
They are enemies for your sake. See, the Jews are enemies because they reject the gospel. Yeah. But as regards election, they are beloved for the sake of the forefathers. For the gifts and the callings of God are irrevocable, are non-changeable. Okay, the gifts and callings of God. So basically what Paul says, no, God has not changed it. At this present time, yeah, we're enemies. But there's, there is going to come a time when Israel, the entire, all Israel, will see that Jesus is their Messiah. And it says, and, and they will grieve the one whom they have pierced. They will mourn the one whom they have pierced. They will see it and they will understand it. So all Israel will be saved. And that day will be extremely glorious. I mean, we're going to see some glorious things just as the body of Christ, the church, when, when we're raptured. But we're really going to, there's some really going to be some great things that's going to happen when you see the people of God uh, redeemed. And well, anyway, that, but that's what he's saying. No, God has not forgotten about Israel. He's faithful to them. And because he's faithful to them, we know he's going to be faithful to us as well. His promises, all his promises are yes. They're not, no. God doesn't, he's not wavering as far as his promises are concerned. He's rock solid, he's faithful. Okay? So he talks about Israel, and he ends that. Then he moves in, after all that's done, and, he, and he's thinking about the mercies of God, after he talks about Israel, his mercy upon the Gentiles and also upon the Jews. He's thinking about that. Then he, he, then he goes into chapter 12, which begins the section on service. You'll find out in chapter 12 on to the rest of the book, he's talking about what we are to do, our duties. He's talking about practical good works that we do, okay? And a key verse there is in chapter 12, verse one. I appeal to you therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. He says, by the mercies of God, he appeals to us. The, the mercies of God, as we understand the mercies of God, that provides us the motivation to just surrender our lives, to give our, present our bodies to him as a living sacrifice. And by the way, that, that term connects to other places in the book of Romans, the idea of presenting ourselves. He says, remember in Romans chapter in Romans chapter 6, he tells us, do not present your members to sin, but present your bodies to the Lord. Okay? So, and we'll get into that later on in this, when we, as we do this study. Okay, so the flow of thought goes to service. And he talks about spiritual gifts a little bit there. He talks about what we do uh, with regard to our, our, our families, our church, what we do in, in society, and all of those things. And he, he, he unfolds that. And he moves through, and he also talks about what we do with weaker brothers. I mean, has some really good, I mean, really good information of how to uh, uh, apply all of this to our daily daily lives. And then last, he begins to conclude, and most of his conclusion really deals with personal relationship, to personal ministry he's had with people, and uh, and he begins to talk about that. And he brings them up. As, uh, as he talks to that church, okay? Until finally at the very end, and I read this for you already, but at the very end, again, he talks about bringing about the obedience of faith. That's the impact that the apostle Paul desires to have in the believers at Rome. And I'm gonna tell you, I think this is the desire that the Holy Spirit wants to have as he moved Paul to write this. This is the, this is, the, this is the desire of the Spirit of God in your life and in my life, that we may obey God, that we may walk by faith in the power of Christ, in the, in the, in the presence of the Holy Spirit, obeying what he's told us to do by his power, okay? All right, well, thank you. If you have any questions, you can email me or you can... Uh, email on the website there. Uh, we will do another one of these each night. Uh, we will begin. We're going to focus on the introduction uh, next Sunday evening. That will be Easter evening, but we're going to be focusing on that 
And we're going to be taking that apart and explaining it bit by bit for you. And then we'll be taking these, these sections apart a little bit, taking whatever time we need. But I don't want to go line upon line, verse upon verse. I don't want to lose you. I want to make sure we keep it flowing really well. Okay? So if the Lord brings us back, if we're able to have, start having church again, I'll continue doing these so that we're, we'll finish out um, we'll finish out Romans. I think the next uh, Sunday school class, we've got the material, is, is Proverbs. And you'll want to start that because I love the book of Proverbs. Okay, for a Sunday school class. If we start that back up here, uh, hopefully in May. Okay, all right. Well, God bless you and we will hopefully see you soon. All right, bye-bye.